Without further ado, I'd like to welcome my friend and my colleague Dhruv Parpia to the stage. Uh, Dhruv works in the Singapore AWS office alongside, uh, along with me and many of us, other of us who are here today. Dhruv will be presenting AWS Mobile Services and the New World of Connected Products. Please welcome Dhruv. Thanks, Chris. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dhruv Parpe, as Chris just mentioned. Um, uh, hopefully, uh, you guys had a good lunch and had a chance to visit our sponsor booths. Uh, it's really important that you guys go and check them out. There's some really cool prizes to be won uh, all over the place. All right. So. Um, as Chris mentioned, I'm a solutions architect. I focus heavily in the Southeast Asia region. And what I'm going to talk to you today is about building mobile applications faster using our um, mobile services. You know, um, a lot of mobile applications are powered by the, uh, the, the cloud today, especially the modern ones. You know, you look at Spotify, you look at Pinterest. Uh, across the board, they're starting to use the cloud in a really, really uh, interesting way. And the main reason for that is for them to be able to scale really fast and to reach a global audience. It, it can be challenging at times if you were building your application and uh, you, know, you were just focusing on one region. But even if you were doing that, it's still uh, possible to really take advantage of uh, cloud services that you have available. So um, uh, we have a whole host of these running on us, right? And what we did was we went up to them and we said, how can we help you further? So uh, we asked them two questions. The first one was, what makes your application unique? And the second one was, where are you spending most of your time? And th these are very important questions. Uh, because what we were trying to achieve out of this was to understand uh, what the goal here is. Right? The goal is to make one equal to two when it comes to these questions. Right? We want to make sure that uh, you should be spending the most time on making your application unique. It should not be in just managing and maintaining things that uh, are mundane and can be done or abstracted to other services, right? But um, what we got back from our, our customers was that, uh, you know, when you look at the, 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 uh, the code that they're actually developing, it's, it's really just undifferentiated heavy lifting. And I'm sure you've heard that quite a bit already. So you know, uh, user identity management and authentication, uh, user data synchronization. Um, these are really, really hard tasks. If you look across this entire list, uh, they're hard to maintain and manage at scale, right? But these are necessary uh, things that you need, right? Um, so what we decided to do was, um, instead of having you worry about these, we wanted you to focus on your user experience. We want you to focus on what makes your app unique and how do you actually do that. So what we've done is we've built services, right? A whole host of services to handle each of these problems individually. So if you look at the top, there's Amazon Cognito, and I'll talk about that in detail. Uh, mobile Analytics, SNS Push uh, Mobile, um, Amazon Lambda, and Mobile Optimized Connectors for some of our other services as well. Um, when you look at the mobile services uh, portfolio, the, the one thing that's very important is that we've developed SDKs for each of these, right? So uh, there's a mobile SDK for iOS, there's a mobile SDK for Android, uh, and for uh, Unity as well. And we'll talk about that later as well. So um, you can access any of our services directly from the mobile device. And that's extremely important and, and, and powerful to understand that you could have uh, access directly to S3 from a mobile device, or access directly to DynamoDB, right? It's all via an endpoint, and all can be done directly from your application. So um, some of the services that we're going to talk about, again, is uh, Cognito, um, mobile analytics, a uh, little bit on push notifications. We'll touch on the Kinesis recorder and DynamoDB mapper. Uh, the transfer manager is important as well, and a couple of the others. Um, so. How do you build a mobile application today? Right? We, we spoke about some of the things that uh, a lot of people just spend time on. Right? Um, you look at the first one, authenticating users. It's extremely important. You want to know who your users are. You want to know what rights and privileges they have. Are they a premium user? Are they a free user? Are they a guest? You want to know this. Right? So you're going to build a layer that actually manages that for them. The second one, again, it kind of maps to the first, which is authorizing access. If this is a premium user, what does he have access to? If this is a guest, 
What does he have access to? Is there a limited set of uh, functionality that you want to provide within the application? All of these things are important. Um, in today's day and age, um, no one here has just one device. Right? Everyone has a mobile phone, everyone has a tablet, everyone has a PC or a laptop of some sort. Right? So how do you get the data to synchronize across all of those different devices? That's another important piece to your application as well. Once you have all of those sorted out, you need to analyze user behavior. Is the application performing the way that you expect it or the way that your users expect it to perform? Right? So how do you analyze user behavior to make sure that it is being uh, consumed in the right way? Or if you need to make a change to make sure that the user experience is what the end user expects. So analytics and analyzing your user behavior is very important there as well. Um, the next thing that you want to do is obviously uh, if there's an event or if something is done on that particular application, you want to run business logic behind it. So that's the crux of your uh, application, right? The business logic that runs behind it. Um, some of the other things that you want to do, store and share media. If you have a media app like an Instagram or a Pinterest, um, you want to deliver the media to them. Uh, you want to send push notifications to uh, increase the user engagement. You want to bring them back if they've left. Um, you want to store any kind of shared data, anything around, you know, uh, let's say you're, you're building an, a game and uh, a, high, a high score chart is an important piece, right? But that's shared data. Everyone needs to be able to see that. So you can store shared data. Um, and then, of course, you can stream some real-time data. Uh, why is that important? If you wanted to manage uh, click stream analytics or anything like that, uh, it's important that you get that data out as fast as possible. And like I said, every single one of these things that I just mentioned can be mapped directly to a Amazon Web Services uh, service, right? So let's go uh, down these step by step. The first one is authenticating users. And this is where I'll introduce uh, Amazon Cognito, right? So Amazon Cognito, um, in three simple steps, uh, is a cross-device and cross-platform synchronization tool. What that basically means is I could have an iOS device, an Android device, or I could use JavaScript on my, uh, on my PC as well. And I would be able to sync my session across all of those. It doesn't matter which device you use. Think about the complexity of doing that today, right? The amount of fragmentation in the Android market, the amount of code that you'd have to write to manage that. All you need to do is add the mobile SDK to your application and add one line of code. And you can manage sync now, right? It's a very powerful tool. Right? Um, the second one, social media logins. Right? Everyone already has some level of uh, uh, social media access. Right? So you can simplify your identity and access management. So if you wanted to have a single sign-on with Facebook, uh, you'd have to write some code, and then you'd have to interface with Facebook. You don't have to do that anymore. You can interface directly with Cognito, and we will manage that for you. So you can do that to Twitter. You can do that to Facebook. You can do that to Digits, which is pretty cool. Uh, I hadn't used it before I saw it in Cognito, actually. Uh, you can use your own authentication. If you use OpenID and you've already got a user base, you can pair that up to Cognito as well. So your work or your application, uh, everything that you've done hasn't gone to waste. You can still leverage it. So it's a pretty powerful tool. Right? Uh, you can also do Google Plus and, of course, Amazon.com. Uh, the last one is you can implement uh, security best practices. And this is something that's very important when it comes to leveraging Amazon Web Services. Um, traditionally, what people did with our platform, or what developers did with our platform, was uh, they would embed a key that would give users access to certain resources on the platform. Now, that can be a little bit uh, tricky, is the best way I can put it. Uh, what if that key gets exposed? What if someone decompiles the application, gets the key? That key has more privileges than necessary. It can be a little scary, because your resources are then exposed, and someone could just launch more instances. You don't need to do that with Cognito. You can leverage identity and access management and make sure that the privileges are provided to the end customer only when necessary, and very, very limited, very granular. So you can control what they have access to all the time. Right? So. Um, I have already gone through this, but you know, identity is so important, and there are multiple different paths here. Right? So you can uh, support multiple login providers. Um, 
The other piece is unique users versus devices. So uh, you, you know, you're going to have uh, different devices and unique users. You can also look at it the other way around in the sense of uh, one device with multiple users. Right? So if, uh, for example, if my wife wants to log in from my iPad, I want her to have a separate account. It can still be managed by Cognito, and that sync is managed as well. And like we said, uh, managing access to mobile analytics, S3, uh, DynamoDB, Kinesis, all of that can be managed uh, from our console or our APIs. Um, I also mentioned earlier that you have access for unauthenticated IDs, right? Uh, so you can do uh, guest user access. So if you want to have someone just access the application without actually logging in or pairing up with, a, uh, with an identity, you can do that. Right? So you can actually have that uh, securely access any of our resources or your application with a guest token that we will define for you. Right? And then the cool thing is later, if you wanted to actually uh, map that to say the person's really happy with the application and wants to log in and really have his identity carry forward, um, all they do is sign in and it follows them. The same ID follows them on. So you don't have to worry about what they've already done in the past, doesn't follow them forward. It just maps on and goes, uh, goes ahead. Right? Um, you can save uh, data to the cloud. So you can save app and device data to the cloud and merge them after login, uh, like I said. And the other cool thing is that you can have a unique identifier for your things. I'm not sure if anyone caught uh, some of the stuff that Marku spoke about or has, has seen him speak in the past, but he loves IoT. We actually had a, a, a hackathon uh, at our offices the, the other day around uh, Internet of Things. So if you have headless connected devices and you wanted those to connect into your application, you could use Cognito to actually manage those apps as well, where they actually don't have a single sign-on login. So getting started with Cognito is really, really simple. You sign into your AWS account. You log into the management console. Uh, you create an, what we call an identity pool. Uh, for authenticated and un unauthenticated users in AWS, and then you download and integrate the mobile SDK into your application. These are the three steps that you need to take to get started with Cognito. It's very powerful, and I highly recommend that you look at using this. So like I said, it's so important that I stress on this, that security is, again, our number one concern. And regardless of uh, who is using our platform, if you develop it correctly using our best practices, uh, hopefully we are a, a secure enough platform for your application, right? So you get to safeguard your AWS credentials. Like I mentioned, you don't want to install keys into your application. You don't want to you, you have it anywhere close to that. You want to use tokens that are provided to your end users so that they can access S3. So let's say I'm building an application that uh, uh, you, know, you, you, you can take pictures and upload them into S3. Does that end user need direct access to a, a, a bucket that has everyone's data? No. They need to have a single time access so that they can upload their file and then they can view it any amount of times that they want. Right? You can control that. You can make sure that the token that they receive is a one time use, they can use it, and then it's gone. And this is already built into Cognito. Right? Um, and again, setting very granular permissions. It's, again, part of how IAM, or identity and access management, works. So of course, you then have your, um, you know, you can, you can use your own um, uh, authenticated identities as well, right? So let's say you already have your uh, username and passwords already set. It's very easy to integrate with your uh, current systems. Uh, you can use our, um, uh, the, the little API that we have over here, get open ID token for developer identity, and then you can use your server-side SDKs for Java, Python, and Ruby uh, to manage that as well. Right, so let's just quickly look at how, what we have over here when it comes to Cognito with identity and access management and fine-grained controlled access. So basically explaining exactly how that would work. So if you look at the flow, right? So we have those multiple identity providers. So we have Twitter, we have Facebook, we have Google+, Amazon, and Digits up there, right? Those are the icons on top. Um, those are the identity providers. You have authenticated IDs and unauthenticated IDs, right? Each of those have an associated IAM role, or identity and access management role, right? So uh, what you have are different identity pools associated with those, right? 
Uh, and, and, and basically, what you can do is you can define access policies. So you can say, for uh, S3, I want to allow gets and I want to allow puts. And for DynamoDB, I want to allow gets and I want to allow deletes, and nothing else. So limit access very, very granularly. And this can be on an individual basis. This could be on an individual role, right? So you have full control over this. The next one is synchronizing data across devices. So you have Amazon Cognito Sync, right? Um, so again, like I said, you have multiple devices. You want to make sure that regardless of which device I log in from, and if I want to play a game, I get to continue exactly where I left off. It should not matter which uh, device I use. If you're building a game for all of the different platforms, you should make sure it's available and they can sync across those devices, right? We basically want to get rid of fragmentation with this, right? Uh, a lot of the times what happens is people say, I'm building my game for the Apple ecosystem and for the Android ecosystem is going to be a completely different experience. What we're trying to do is try and help you close that gap a little bit. So you get to store app data, preferences, and state on the device itself. If you have uh, any kind of cross devices, you can sync those as well. The really cool thing here is that because we're installing the SDK into your application, you don't have to worry about when the, the device goes offline. There's an offline sync available for the, the device now. So we basically set up a SQLite database within the application uh, that would keep the data that's important to you when it comes to syncing. When the de device comes back online, it syncs it with Cognito, and then it's made available again for use. Um, and <clears throat> like I said, there's no back end. This entire platform that I've talk talked about right now, we actually haven't talked about having a server once. So that entire piece that you'd otherwise have to manage is gone. You don't have to worry about your identity brokers. You don't have to worry about having servers for people to log into. All of that is abstracted from you. It's install the SDK, write one line of code, and then off you go. Um, <clears throat> So there's some other stuff that you can do with syncing uh, user profiles. So obviously, the first one is sync the user profiles. But the second one is state transition. What that basically means is you can link multiple accounts. So if you wanted to have your own uh, user account as well as, say, Facebook or Google Plus or Amazon, whatever it might be, you can actually use state transition to have those uh, locked together. And then, <clears throat> like I mentioned, you can sync game states. It's a great example, actually. So um, if I'm playing, say, Clash of, Clash of Clans, and I'm playing it on my iOS device, I stop playing it at a certain point. I can continue on from my iPad later. <clears throat> so um, a good example of someone who uh, uses us pretty well is Concrete Software. Um, they're a pretty cool gaming company. And their challenge was to provide a seamless user experience across devices and platforms to their users. Right? Uh, they wanted to store save games in the cloud and synchronize them across all of the user's devices. So basically, the, when they saw what we were doing with Cognito, they latched onto it, and they found it worked really, really well for them. Imagine having to do that with servers right now. Imagine having to manage all of those different moving parts. It's not adding anything to your actual application. Yes, it's improving user experience because they're happy they can use any application, or oh, sorry, any device, but is that what your application's about? Not really. You want to make sure that your game is cool, or you want to make sure that your application is fast and snappy and does what it needs to do. Right. So like I said, Cognito Sync. We use a SQLite cache, um, and you can sync it across any of the devices that you want. The um, <clears throat> really cool thing is that it's uh, pretty intelligent when it comes to syncing. It has a very flexible conflict resolution. Uh, the default conflict resolution is usually the last, uh, the last sync wins. Right? But if you don't want to use that, and if you feel that a certain device always has priority over the other devices, you, you have the ability of changing that to whatever uh, uh, suits your application's needs. It's not always last device wins or last sync wins. So like I said, how do you integrate this? One line of code. Right? Um, that's for Android. So you initialize the credential provider and the Cognito client with that, that code. You create an open database and add key values, and then you call synchronize on the data set. That's it. That's how it works. Same thing goes for iOS. Very simple. Um, again, initialize the Cognito sync client, create an o or open the data set, add the key values, and then call the sync. That's all you need to do. 
You don't need servers. You don't need any kind of uh, additional code on this. It's already done for you. OK, so once we're done with syncing the data and once we're, we're done with <clears throat> making sure that the SDK is already built in, what's the next thing that we need to do? We need to understand how people are using the application. How do we improve the application? Right? The application is being logged into. It's being played a lot. But we want to get user feedback. We want to understand how that's done. Right? So traditionally, you would have to take all of the logs and then look for your daily actives, look for your monthly actives, and try and figure out that by yourself. But now with, um, when you use the mobile SDK, what we start to do is we start to give you metrics that matter almost immediately. Right? Uh, and you can scale to billions of event points per day from millions of users. Right? Uh, it's, completely, uh, it's, it's completely scalable. And the most important part, you own your data. This is not something that Amazon keeps a hold of. It is in your account. You can take it out from there and then move it into any different format that you want to. If you want to use a different analytics tool, you can. It's in your hands. So how do we get started? Again, sign up for an AWS account, create an existing uh, or, or use an existing uh, Cognito ID in the console. Again, you have to integrate the SDK. And uh, then you get to view engagements and session activity reports in the console. Um, you may be asking, what does that look like? Is it something that's really hard to use? How am I supposed to understand the data and information that you're providing me with? So I'll just show you a couple of examples. So again, one, two, three. Go to Cognito, install the SDK, view the reports. Basically, you get to win really fast, right? So what do the reports look like? So this is a standard report that we provide with uh, mobile analytics. You get daily active users, monthly active users, the new users, uh, the sticky factor, how often they're coming back, uh, total sessions, and day one retention. Right? So basically, these are key metrics that you need for your application in one line of code. Right? All of these will be provided to you as soon as you uh, add that line of code into your, SD, uh, into your application. Um, so this is a, a, another really important piece uh, when you look at it. Right? You want to track retention. You want to understand um, how important it is. Uh, you know, if you make a user experience change, you want to see if it impacts your, your retention in a positive way or in a negative way. And it's very important that you see that. Right? So uh, the moment you make that change, you get to see that um, uh, in your real time. Basically, it takes about 60 minutes for it to start populating. And then you have that information available to you. You may also be saying that this is not granular enough. This is not everything that I need. Um, <clears throat> so we also have the ability to track custom events. So you can define that based upon what your application is. right? So let's say you have a song application, and you want to see the number of songs played per user session in a, in a, in a music app. You can track that. right? You can track the number of likes or shares per article in a news app. It's all possible. These are custom app, uh, custom app metrics that you can just add into mobile analytics. Um, and again, like I said, integrating mobile analytics is super, super simple. It's literally a few lines of code. You add it <coughs> into, your, uh, into your app, and off you go. You, it automatically starts sending in that information into your, uh, into your uh, dashboard. That's for Android. This is for iOS. They're fairly straightforward. Uh, hopefully, most developers would understand what this is. Um, and it's not just about um, you know, seeing the, the stuff that you can get out of our dashboard. If you want to do more stuff around big data and you want to run really custom queries, um, mobile analytics really, really likes, or I should say, <coughs> HOTS, S3, and Redshift. Right? Um, so basically, what you can do is you can take all of the analytics that you're getting from each of those devices, and you can pipe them straight into, uh, into S3 and Redshift. And then you can run whatever BI tool that you want in front of it to get truly custom metrics, truly mapped to exactly what your business needs. Right? Um, I mean, it's a, it's a great question, right? A lot of people ask, how is my game performing across platforms? So, you know, uh, a good example is you can take your mobile client, you, can, you, you send the, the data into mobile analytics, and then that pipes the data into S3. <clears throat> um, the next thing you'd see is probably something around, you know, how you manage exporting your data from uh, the mobile analytics dashboard into S3, right? So you have to set up a few IAM roles. Uh, it's fairly straightforward. And then you can say you auto-export it into S3. It's going to happen automatically, as you want it, when you want it. 
Um, from there, you have multiple options. Once it hits S3, you can do whatever it is that you want with it. Right? It is data that is raw, and you can consume it however you see fit. So if you want to send it into Redshift, you can send it into Redshift. If you want to do a batch Hadoop or a Spark process on it, you can do that as well. If you want to just you know, archive it, keep it for long, uh, a long-term storage, you can just move it straight into Glacier as well with a lifecycle policy. The choice is yours. However you see fit to use this data, you can. Um, you can also augment your data. So you have this data in S3. You've moved it into Redshift. And now you want to say, this is not enough. I have more data that's sitting on a database. I want to add that to my user analytics. So you could take your external data, pipe that into Redshift, where all of your other data is stored, and augment it. So you get truly, truly custom metrics. It shouldn't just be one view. It should be from both sides, right? So if you do have servers running, and you want to understand how the user is interacting, maybe you want to check out how, how the, the latency of the application is, right, uh, based upon user uh, interactions versus uh, server-side um, return functions, right? If you want to mention, uh, measure that, you'd have to augment the data, right? So you could add that data into Redshift, and now you have a single pane view into exactly um, what you need. Right? So again, this is a case of just exporting your data into Redshift. And then, once you have all the data in there, you can use a number of different um, uh, business intelligence tools in front of it to view it in the form that you feel necessary. Remember, Redshift is basically going to expose a Postgres SQL connector for JDBC and ODBC. And all of these different partner pro uh, products are basically capable of reading from that platform. So it's really, really powerful. Um, a, good, a good case study here, uh, Forza Football. This is a, an application that was developed um, around the time of the World Cup. Uh, it was done in Sweden, I believe. And uh, basically, they're the world's second largest football application. right? And this is just after two and a half years of business. So one thing that they found was very, very interesting was that the World Cup was the most interesting for Americans. right? They actually found that. This time around, with the, the amount of uh, you know, social, uh, social media explosions around, uh, around the World Cup this year, and of course the US uh, soccer team doing really, really well, they found that, that the United States was actually well up there when it came to um, uh, viewing on this application. Right? Um, they also were able to get some really cool metrics around uh, user per capita. Right? How many people were actually viewing this uh, this application, what were they using, all of this stuff was available to them. This is, this is gold for a lot of people, right? This is something that they could really use. This is just a conjunction of using mobile analytics and maybe augmenting it with a little bit more data. And you get to see some really interesting statistics on what is important for your application. Um, they, they also ran a little campaign uh, around a vote, right? They wanted to also see how um, users were interacting in their application. So, uh, basically, if you notice that the application was most popular in Italy, but as you can see, the United Kingdom and the United States were not, well, they were half, but uh, from the rest of them, they were pretty far up there. But if you notice this side, the voting percentage versus non-voting percentage of users, right? They found that within each country, they were fairly even, right? Between, between 15 and 25%. So their engagement from an application perspective was awesome across the globe, right? Um, there were a few countries that weren't, but majority of the time, they found that they were getting exactly what they expected out of the application. And they may not have been able to get these insights without getting that data out from there. Um, they also got a great split on uh, you know, um, which devices are being used the most. And as you can see over here, uh, the iPhone kind of ruled, right? It was more than 50%, or I should say iOS ruled. It was more than 50% of their, their usage. Um, but the other side, you can see the fragmentation of, of Android as well. It's pretty stark. But all of this was kind of managed from a login perspective, uh, from an a analytics perspective. They had all of this data because they had the mobile SDK installed. It was very simple for them. They already had the data. right? So. Coming back to that original slide of uh, what are the things that you need to take care of. So let's say that we've covered off analyzing the user behavior. The next one is uh, running business logic. And this is an important one as well. So um, 
everything I've spoken to uh, up to this point has been about not needing servers, right? We don't need a server for uh, single sign-on. We don't need a server for analytics, right? We're handling all of that stuff for you guys. What about business logic, right? What if we were to talk about running serverless backends optimized for mobile, right? What, is, what does that even mean, right? So I don't know if you guys caught the uh, session that Marku did uh, in the morning around Lambda, but I'm sure you guys heard what Glenn Gore had to say about Lambda, right, uh, during the keynote. Um, it, it really is a game changer, right? You, can, you, you have zero administration. Um, it completely scales by itself, and you can bring your own code with JavaScript. All you need to do is, is code and put it into Lambda. And then you can do whatever it is that you want from there. You don't need a server. You never need to run a server for this, right? So you may be thinking, how am I supposed to use this with my mobile application, right? So start thinking about it from the terms of a back-end service. So let's say uh, I take a picture with my phone, right? Um, I upload that picture. A Lambda process kicks off. What does it do? Maybe it adds a filter. Maybe it makes a thumbnail, right? Do I need a server for that? Usually I would, right? If I had to make thumbnails, if I had to do a multiple filters, I'd need a server. Um, you don't need that with Lambda. It's literally event-driven. So if there's an upload into S3, as an example, on the upload, we could then kick off a process, a, a filter, um, you know, or anything else that you want to do. The, the options are truly yours. However complex you want to make it, you can, right? As long as it's event-driven. For now, Lambda is event-driven, right? Um, a data trigger. So if you have you know, uh, certain compute functions when data changes in another AWS service, right? It has nothing to do with uh, something coming from a mobile app. But let's say that that mobile app impacted uh, high score. is a great, good example, right? So in DynamoDB, my high score changed. What does that mean? Does that mean I have to recompile the uh, leaderboard? Or does that mean I have to uh, send out um, you know, uh, a prize to the new leader? Right? Do I need a server for that? No. The answer is no again. Right? So you can do all of this stuff without servers. From an IoT perspective or a mobile perspective, right? uh, you can basically trigger an event from an IoT device. So if an IoT device sends a whole bunch of things into Kinesis, as an example, right? it's sending metrics about uh, what it's doing. Um, if it's listening to uh, uh, the, the ambient sound in a certain area and it passes a certain level in volume, trigger an event. Do something with it. Raise an alarm. Right? You can do all of that with Lambda. Right? Um, if it comes to uh, stream processing, right, you can, again, manage it from uh, uh, the DynamoDB streams or uh, Kinesis streams. Right? Uh, indexing and synchronization. So this is a really cool one. Right? So uh, on a sync event from a mobile device, so let's say we're using Cognito, we call a sync event. On sync, we can now launch a Lambda function. What could that Lambda function do? Right? Maybe we want to cross-verify. We want to make sure that it's syncing the right information. Maybe we want to make sure that the, the user isn't gaming the system. We can do all of that now without servers. All of this was capable, but it always needed a server. It doesn't need one now. A um, good example of all of this is, uh, is comply. Right? So comply basically replaced Node.js applications that took care of Facebook, Twitter, with Lambda functions, and switched over all of their EC2 instances that were doing that. Right? Just think about this for a second. The way we charge EC2 is on a per hour basis. Right? That means every hour that you're running that EC2 instance, we charge you for it. Right? You can start to, to build up to being an expensive proposition at, over time, right? um, just depending upon how large your scale is. Now, what if I was to say that we take, we take that all out of the picture and just say only if someone um, runs something, whatever it might be, be it a Facebook like or a, uh, or a, um, you know, a, a Twitter share, only on that event will we then launch something that computes, runs a function, and then shuts itself down. And how do we charge for that? We charge by the millisecond. Right? So every, I believe it's every 100 milliseconds we're charging for this. So how long does the function run for? And then it shuts down. And then you're charged for that. 
So you're not running it 24 by 7. The function's always available, right? Uh, and it can be used whenever you want to. So like I said, again, we've integrated with the mobile SDK. Um, any Cognito event can be sent into it. Uh, we're adding a whole bunch of really cool stuff to Lambda as well. We're going to add Java support uh, for Lambda <coughs> excuse me, uh, very soon. Uh, there's going to be Cloud Trail integration, some enhanced metrics, and logging via CloudWatch as well. So some really cool and exciting stuff happening with Lambda in the near future. Oh, sorry, before I forget, uh, we also have SNS integration. What does that mean? So I could literally send a push notification out and on that trigger an event. Or I could send an HTTP notification uh, from a device. Remember, with Cognito, I have access to all of my different services within AWS. So if I want to give the ability to a, an application to send a notification out, I could do that as well. Right? So you have full control. Um, you know, completely serverless backend. You don't need anything. You can basically send a push notification to a device, and then from there, run a whole host of functions, whatever that might be. However you want to imagine it, it can be that. So yeah, uh, how do we actually do this? Like I said, a few lines of code. Right? Every single thing that we do when it comes to uh, creating this within the SDK is literally a few lines of code. How big your Node.js application is, that really is up to you. Right? If you want to run your entire application all in Node.js, you can. But then, of course, you'd have to write those lines of code. But this is when it comes to integrating it into your SDK. It's fairly short. I don't have the iOS slide, unfortunately, over here. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the other services, right? So let's talk a little bit more about uh, storing and delivering media via S3. This is a really important piece as well. Um, so we've recently announced that you can use mobile optimized connectors for the AWS mobile SDK. What does this mean for you? Right? So this basically means that I have a transfer manager, I have a Kinesis recorder, I have a DynamoDB mapper. All of these are now optimized for the mobile device. Right? Uh, so I can do um, a whole host of things when it comes to um, my transfer manager. The first one being multi-part upload. Right? So a lot of the times when you take a picture with your phone or if you have a file on your phone and you want to send it across to your application, uh, if you have uh, you know, uh, a bit of a sketchy network, it can be troublesome uploading that. Right? Or if it's a large file, it's going to take a long time. What multi-part uploads uh, allows you to do is kind of break up the file into multiple chunks and upload them simultaneously. Right? And then what we do at the, at the other end on S3's end is we stitch it together. OK? So basically, let's take a, a 10 MB file, break it into four different or five different chunks, and upload it at the same time, and st stitch it together on the other side. So it's very, very cool. It leverages your phone, obviously, to break it up, but then we can, we can stitch it back together on our side. It's completely fault tolerant when it comes to downloading. Um, you can do pauses, you can do resumes, you can do cancel functions, uh, and it's optimized for uh, use within the operating system natively. Um, outplay. Really cool example, right? So uh, they're building games. Uh, as you've probably seen on your phones, these games are getting really, really large, right? You're, you're getting massive games on your phones. And when you download it from the App Store, that's just the first part of it. The second part is actually getting the additional assets that are necessary for these games, right? So what they did was really, really cool. So they were able to improve the user experience by allowing you to start playing the game and then because we are a native app now, or built into your app, they were able to download the rest of the assets behind the scenes. The user has a seamless experience. They're able to play the game while the assets are being downloaded. Once the assets are there, they just keep playing. They don't see the difference. You can resume those whenever you want to. right? So when you start to think about how that can be uh, consumed, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. right? Um, they got excellent performance. They were able to get you know, a whole bunch of things downloaded to a whole bunch of different devices. And it was really, really tremendous for them. Um, the other piece that's really important is delivering you know, media to the masses. Uh, S3 is great when you want to give out these assets. But if you want to deliver it globally, you want to think about using something like CloudFront. 
What CloudFront allows you to do is basically, uh, it's our CDN network. So we have these 53 edge locations across the globe. And what, what we can do is we can cache the content much closer to your end users. So that basically means that if someone wants to download an, a video, uh, the first person that downloads the video gets it from the origin. That it, let's say that's S3 as an example. But the second person gets it from the edge where it was cached. Right? So if I have a whole bunch of users in the United States, let's say in Los Angeles, the first guy to pull the video from S3, uh, it takes a little bit of time. But the second one onwards, it's lightning fast because it's already stored and cached over there, much closer to the end user. Right. Uh, the next one is uh, sending push notifications. So, you know, uh, again, we asked the question around, uh, you know, what do push notifications mean to you as a customer, right? Do you need to do it? And everyone said yes, because push notifications are so important at retaining customers or getting them back to, to, to actually consume your application, right? And not just that, it's also about communication within the application, right? So sending large-scale push notifications cross-platform is still hard, right? And developers want to be able to reach their customers globally across all these different devices. So, you know, you've got uh, the Google uh, platform, you've got Apple, you've got Baidu, you've got a whole host of these platforms, and you have to manage all of this. What we basically did was we launched um, Amazon Simple Notification System, oh, sorry, Simple Notification Services cross-platform mobile push. Basically, a uniform API for you to consume for all of the different mobile push networks. If you want to access Apple APNS, Google GCM, Baidu CP, Amazon ADM, uh, Windows as well, right? If you want to access any of those different networks, you can use it with a uniform uh, API. You can register those mobile devices and push to them with a uniform API. Your code becomes far simpler, OK? Um, a good example of this is Path. I'm sure most of you guys have heard of Path. If you haven't, they're a social network that's very focused on close friends and family. You're not going to add a whole large network. You're going to have just your close friends in there, right? Um, so they're a huge user of the platform. They have roughly 5 million daily active users, right? Uh, and they create billions of impressions monthly. So originally, this is what just their push network looked like. They had six load balancers. They had 35 AWS EC2 M3 large instances running nonstop just to handle push notifications, right? They were never certain how many pushes were going to be sending or how many they were dropping. They had no metrics around that, right? But they still needed to send them out, and they wanted to send out even more. They switched over. They started using SNS push notifications. And what they did was that they went from day one doing 10 million to over 500 million push notifications on day three. Day three, right? Um, and now here's the really, really crazy part. If you remember the, um, this architecture I showed you, right? This is running 24 by 7. It doesn't matter. This is a cost to them, right? They sent out 500 million messages on the third day. We charge $1 per million mobile push deliveries, OK? So imagine that infrastructure for a second and how much that costs you per hour versus uh, $500 for 500 million uh, push notifications, right? Significant savings there. And again, you get the efficiency. You get the notifications to yourself to know if they were delivered or not. It was, you know, it was very, very easy for them to manage. And again, customers love the, uh, the re reliability of SNS, right? Uh, Mailbox uses it. Um, uh, others uh, securely uses it as well. And uh, Jetpack, Joyride, Fruit Ninja, they all use push notifications. Uh, and they find it, it really starts to bring people back into the game as well, right? So if you don't want to get user retention, you really want to look at something like push notification services. So again, the next piece is really sh uh, storing shared data, right? So uh, I spoke a little bit about, about this at the start. So uh, what we have now is uh, an object mapper, right? So let's say we have Joe, Anna, and Bob. Um, and they're all playing a game, right? Um, firstly, DynamoDB, 
just if anyone doesn't know, is a key value store NoSQL database, right? Uh, this is a completely managed service from Amazon Web Services, where we basically take care of um, the, the management of the infrastructure for you. Uh, coming back to the whole design of serverless backends, right? So let's say we have a high score table, and uh, you know uh, Joe, Anna, and Bob all have different scores, right? Um, basically, with Cognito, you can access this uh, fairly straightforward. You don't need to have um, any uh, any server side interaction. Your phone could directly call this information. Right? You don't need to transform the objects. You don't need to do anything. You can literally look at it from the device itself, as long as you're using something like um, uh, Cognito or, or our mobile SDK, I should say. Right? Very easily access any of the services that we want. Um, Hitpoint is a good example of someone that used this. Right? So they built an entire platform uh, where they were able to reduce their hosting and content delivery costs by over 45%. Right? Um, they're, they're, they're getting, I, I believe it's uh, new, new content weekly to 250,000 monthly active users. So they were able to build a very cool platform where they were able to send notifications, use mobile analytics, deliver the, the content via CloudFront. Uh, they use Cognito for uh, user management, Kinesis for event streaming, and uh, EC2 compute and Elastic Beanstalk for a couple of other things for them. Uh, the last one that I'm going to touch upon is uh, collecting real-time stream click data with Kinesis, right? Um, so basically, uh, you can use Kinesis, which um, can, can scale to whatever length you want, right? So imagine having uh, an app that has more than a million users. Collecting that data real-time is going to be extremely challenging, right? Making sure that that data is then made available in real time is even more challenging. So using something like this, uh, you can actually send that data directly from the phone, from the SDK, to a Kinesis stream. Right? Um, from there, you can then use a Kinesis-enabled application to then run a, a transform or some kind of a process on it so you can get real-time analytics out of that data. Right? Um, you can then store it into S3 or into Redshift. And then what you get is really sophisticated user behavior in real time. So if you tweak your application, right, you get to see how it's uh, reacting in the market. You get to see if, uh, let's say, as an example, if, um, if the purple monster or the blue monster, an A-B test right, uh, that a game a company like Wooga ran, uh, they found out which monster worked better. And you could do that in real time. You could find out who's interacting more with a certain monster. right? Um, another company that actually did a whole bunch of stuff around this was Sega. Uh, Hardlight Studios, which is basically uh, known for um, <clears throat> the, the mobile applications that they developed for Sonic the Hedgehog. They basically uh, used Kinesis for their, um, uh, for their stream data coming from the apps, right? from all the Sonic the Hedgehog apps. It's, a, it's an extremely popular uh, icon. right? It's like uh, Mario in that sense. So they were able to get some really cool information. They were able to um, change the way the application was behaving and make sure that it worked correctly for uh, the end users. All right, so these are some of the services that we would put together that you could use um, across the board within your application. Right? So in summary, um, you have a fully integrated mobile SDK. Like I said, it's available on iOS, Android. If you guys are game developers, Unity is available as well. Uh, if you're developing a web app as well, you have JavaScript. And we're coming out with Xamarin soon. It's in uh, developer preview mode right now. Right? So you know, all of your common authentication mechanisms are handled. You can automatically handle intermittent network connections through our sync. So we have the, the local SQLite database. Um, you have cross-platform support. We have na native SDKs that are optimized for the mobile operating systems, and you can reduce the memory footprint. Right? You don't need to have those additional pieces for the application to actually sync or to authenticate or anything like that. Um, another thing from, a, from the summary is really that the mobile services work really, really well together. Right? So Cognito, again, allows you to access any of our AWS services from the mobile SDK. Right? 
Um, it also allows you to do push synchronization. Uh, and then from an app analytics perspective, you can export it into S3 and Redshift as well. The second one, of course, is uh, DynamoDB. Uh, using DynamoDB in its uh, new stream form, you can actually use it with Lambda to run functions directly. Right? Um, you have Kinesis that can also work with um, uh, Lambda. Right? So you can trigger based on a stream. So if there's even one event in a stream, you can then trigger a function to be called, and then you can process it. Uh, the same thing goes for S3. If uh, an object is put into S3, you can trigger a Lambda function and actually do something with it. And the last one, which we announced very recently, is basically uh, if there's a push notification, it can be consumed within Lambda. Um, if you sync within Cognito, it can be used within Lambda. And um, you can actually send a Cognito stream directly into Kinesis now as well. So really, really powerful stuff. Um, Hopefully, uh, you get to use it, right? So again, how are AWS mobile services different? They're completely serverless, and they scale automatically. You don't need to build any of this stuff for your application. They all work together, like I showed you, right? You can build a full application stack without any servers behind it, and they all work together. And then, of course, they're fully integrated and easy to get started with. Um, and you know something that's really awesome about uh, AWS is that all of these different um, services are available free of charge for a limited amount, right? So if you go to aws.amazon.com/mobile, uh, you'll be able to see what the free tier looks like for each of these. In fact, they're up there. So you get with Lambda, you get one million uh, free requests per month, or 400,000 uh, gigabyte seconds, I believe it is, um, and then uh, you've got 12 months free with. Uh, a million sync requests within Cognito, a um, hundred million events within <laughs> mobile analytics, and then of course one million push messages every month, regardless of uh, duration, are free with um, uh, SNS. And uh, that's it. So thank you so much for attending, and uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of the summit.